Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today we have the delight of home gamers and hobbyists everywhere and the bane of anyone in industry. This is an electric linear actuator. Now as a hobbyist, these things are fargan awesome on account of sticking some pixies in yonder wire and having this chooch forwards and forwards and gives you high force just like a hydraulic cylinder. Now, if you're an industrial type, you know these things don't last for shit. As a hobbyist, they're the shit. As an industrial guy, they're the shits. Reason being, some fucking engine nerds constraints will get squeezed on the financial side and they'll say to themselves, hey, why don't we replace this hydraulic cylinder with an electric linear actuator? Does the same thing. No! And yes, they are and are not the same thing. You don't have any overload protection on these little electric jobbies. Whereas on the hydraulic, of course, if you overpressure it, if you whack it or spike it or whatever, the pressure spikes and the pressure uh, relief valve uh, goes over relief and eliminates that pressure spike. So there's over overload protection, physical, mechanical overload protection built in to the pneumatic and the hydraulic actuator. There is no mechanical overload protection on these things. There's so many moving parts in here. There's a whole gear train in here and then a whole bunch of rotary elements and they are prone. The more moving parts, the more complicated, the more prone it is to breaking down. Now the problem of course is Somebody will throw this into a system instead of a hydraulic cylinder and it will work nominally for a short time, but you'll end up replacing it a lot more because a hydraulic cylinder, one moving part, it's got a mechanical seal and it's always bathed in oil, uh, skookum as for rig. These things, not very skookum unless you oversize them and even then, in some applications, like we see in, in the mining industry and in heavy industry, there's a lot of vibration going on. All of these little parts are all vibrating, so even if it doesn't move, if it's not actuating, it still wears right out. So these are starting to get well entrenched in prosumer grade heavy equipment. You know, small little excavators and, and that sort of thing, rock trucks, and also in proper construction equipment. We're starting to see these for ancillary equipment, uh, latches, you know, like on a bobcat to, to latch forks or a bucket in, or also on, on cabs to lift cabs up and to lift hoods up to get at engines. We're seeing these. Now, why would the likes of a thick yellow painted kitty cat put a part like this in their gear if they know it's gonna wear out? Because all of these construction company equipment suppliers are in the spare parts game. Spare parts, that's where the money is, partner. It's not in service. Service is a lost leader, essentially. They, a lot of times, lose money on sending a guy out to the field to fix stuff. What they're doing is providing service so that they can sell you parts. So this, my friends, is a perfect example of a part that could be conceivably engineered to fail. Not that any manufacturer would ever, ever do that. I got her hooked up and we're just gonna electrify it, what for seeing how it chooches. There we are. In, out. I just gotta reverse the leads, the polarity. And this one actually is a good one because it has a limit switch. It, it stops, but you'll notice like on latches on the Bobcats or rather the, the yellow colored Bobcats, there's no switch there to stop it. It just clicks away, clack, 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 clack. And there's a friction clutch in there that's supposed to, that limits the torque. But why wouldn't there be a switch that just turns it off? I'll tell you, well, we already went over why there's not a switch. Spare part sales. And there we have it, reenactment of an August time dip in Lake Superior. There she blows, disrobed it, and lo and behold, a whole bunch of MIM parts, metal injection molded, uh, centered metallic, yada, yada, yada. I talk about this every video, and every video I learn something new, and people get mad at me for mentioning it because it's boring. So you get the idea. Quite 
the gear train, you can you can clearly see, or or maybe your spider sense is telling you that there might be a bit of a gear reduction there. So we trade off speed on the output of the motor for torque on the input of this shaft of Rooney. We'll have a look at the focus, you fuck. <laughs> we'll look at the grease, high sticktivity, opaque, probably calcium sulfonate, nice uh, high temperature grease, nothing wrong with that. But I've been wrong before, could be bog standard lithium complex grease. Eight, oh, we're done. 18, probably uh, 40 to one, something like that. 40 to one gear reduction, maybe 50 to one, close enough for the girls I go out with. Interesting arrangement here. The drive pinion has a D drive. You can see there's a flat on the shaft. That what transmits the torque. And through here, these are just on little bearing pins. And in the input, there's actually a shear pin that drives. So that's the easiest to machine, cheapest. And it's just retained in there. As you can not so clearly see. And here we have what looks to be a sintered steel bushing. See if it's hardened. Hard as a coffin nail. And it's riding on that shaft. And that's just... Looks like more of a spacer just for this. Just to locate this. And then we have a 608 roller skate bearing. Of course, anytime they can use 608 bearings, there's so many of them made because of rollerblading and skateboards and all that, that the cost, the economy of scale is such that you can pick up roller skate bearings for way cheaper than the next size up or the next size down. Just, they're so common. There's a novel idea for the wire retention. Of course, two wires go to the limit switch. And there's two limit switches, one for reverse and one for forward. And what we've got, we've just got these little spring pin retainer clips in order to keep that wire from getting in the works. And in the rear basal platen, we have a little thrust washer and an oil light bronze bushing, centered bronze. It's got oil in there and the housing. Nicely painted, of course, metallic fleck paint. And that's not metal at all that makes the flex. It's actually the mineral mica flat platelet type mineral and it is in everything. Now I'll just take care with their mitten grabbing routine. What for not uh, sprungen springen. And... Huh. Oh, this is neat. There's a couple little micro switches which just came into focus. And a UHMW follower on the rod that actuates those micro switches. What for telling it to de -chooch. Now let's have a look, see at the baculum. This is where the stud meets the dam. And I was mistaken, these are not roller elements. This one's too cheap. That's just an Acme thread form, but uh, no, not a buttress thread form, an Acme. Buttress is flat on the back side. This has got, uh, I think it's 60 degree angulation on the thread form itself, if you look at it. And that is roughly, roughly, we'll go one inch and we'll start counting there that's one two three four five six seven eight eight or is that nine no because that's a half so that's eight so that's the same as the one inch course national course fastener so that's cool because we can figure out how much torque this needs this rod needs in order to actually get the 260 pounds rated out of here. Uh, interesting, just to see how little torque it will take. You'll be surprised at how little torque this will take to get a hell of a lot of force out of here. Of course, the reason for that is any thread, any threaded fastener is essentially a wedge, which is an inclined plane, a simple, what do you call that? A simple mechanical contrivance wrapped around a cylinder. And the farther you put it in there, the farther the wedge wedges in, and it gives you an incredible amount of force. Now, taking it all the way out, and all we have is a focus, you, a greasy piece of UHMW in there, and that is what makes the cock for Dolly. Unfortunately, it escapes me the clamping load and, and so forth on that uh, eight threads per inch, but what we can do 
is I sent out with the rulers a handy dandy chart here what for showing you the clamp load at whatever torque you so we know it's eight threads per inch so we can use that fastener and uh, 5450 like 5450 pounds clamping load is 900 foot pounds dry of course this is wet and it's not steel on steel so we'll have to add a fudge factor at the end but what we can do is use the rule of three and of course what that is is you you put an equal sign here and we'll put the 54 500 here and the 900 here and 260 pounds here we take 260 times 900 which is 26 times 10 minus 26 so that's 260 minus 26 is 234 234 thousand pounds goes over here over here sorry and then we divide this number 234,000 divided by 54 so we're going to be right around four four and three quarter no four and a third we're going to be four and a third 4.3 foot pounds it takes to get 260 foot pounds out of this end that's incredible and of course we have to reduce that because that number on the chart I gave you is actually dry steel on steel at the, so we reduce the coefficient of friction you probably only need like one or two foot pounds on here now divide that two ish foot pounds by 40 to get you what the motor is putting out in torque and we got fuck all in a big ship and that really is amaze balls to me physics it's incredible this is running you can see it's running here 9.4 volts 300 milliamps is drawn and yeah 260 pounds out of that thing incredible just pulled the magnet housing out two pole permanent magnet DC motor brushed and you can see how craptacularly that is built see the magnet wire there that's just crimped in ends flopping in the breeze there that is why this sits around vibrating in a machine oh we can see epoxy uh, balanced uh, apparently it's a number 32 that motor rotor armature is not gonna last we're gonna get her back together and take her to her natural or rather unnatural conclusion looks like the gland end here is Delarin over molded with some sort of soft durometer just to keep the, the schmoo out. You know, the big ball bearings and the big chunks of nugget. Okay, got her back together. Contact. Works. Not bad. Not tea bag. But oh, there you have it. That's how a linear actuator works. That's why it's not suitable for all applications, but super awesome for home gamers. Thanks for watching. Keep your dick in a vice.